Okay, it's 11 o'clock, so let's go ahead and get this conference started. Um, welcome to the uh, Queer Star Wars panel. Uh, my name is Matt Jacobson. I'm a professor in Film and Media Studies at the University of Kansas, and I am the moderator for this panel. And uh, the first thing I'd like to do is have everyone introduce themselves and uh, just talk a little bit about who you are and um, start the conversation. Very good. I am Vivian Trask. I write as Vivian Kate. I am cisgender bisexual. I identify that way. And I write science fiction, fantasy, horror, steampunk, just about everything. And I also edit the same. Uh, I'm Martha Wells, and I'm a writer. Uh, I've been uh, writing since that my first book came out in 1993. I write mostly fantasy. My recent series is The Books of the Raxura. Uh, my the most recent book came out is The Edge of Worlds. It came out in April. I did the Star Wars novel Razor's Edge, uh, the Princess Leia novel, and I was a, been a big fan of Star Wars since I was since it first came out when I was I think 13. And uh, I loved fan fiction and everything about Star Wars for, for many years, and I still do. I'm Amy Sturgis. I'm a professor of intellectual history at Lenore Ryan University, and I write about and I teach actually a course that's both uh, an undergraduate version and a graduate version uh, of a course called The Force of Star Wars, uh, examining the epic. And I'm a first generation Star Wars fan, and uh, like I said, I write about it and I teach about it. I also do um, podcasting. I'm uh, one of the voices and pens behind um, Starship Sofa, which uh, won Hugo a few years ago. And I um, have also done some stuff on the history of Star Wars for the podcast, so I'm delighted to be here. My name is Mary Trezillo. Uh, you know, I came up with my credentials for talking about gay topics uh, rather than for talking about Star Wars. I've, so I stood in line a long time for the first, the, the early Star Wars, uh, and you know, we had policemen prod us because we were leaning against the wall and we weren't supposed to, even though we had been there for six hours. <laughs> so I'm a big Star Wars fan. Um, my credentials as a writer about gay uh, topics, uh, I won an award, and I, I can't tell you the name of it exactly, for a novelette called E.Y. Panoma, which was about two women um, in the age of Elizabeth who were persecuted for being gay. Um, I have an unpublished novel, which I probably never will publish, about a world in which uh, the bias against gay people is reversed and the bias is against people who are heterosexual. And I don't know whether my characters are gay or not because they haven't told me or not in a novel coming up called Mars Girls from Apex 2017 and my Nebula Award winner, uh, An Old Fashioned Martian Girl, which was from two, uh, 1999. Thank you. So in the uh, research that I did uh, before coming in to moderate, um, I couldn't help but notice that it, it looks as though the Star Wars universe, uh, both the expanded universe previously and uh, the, the later works, all seem to have kind of a spotty record when it comes to the inclusion of uh, characters who are LGBT. Would anyone on the panel care to talk a little bit about the historical precedence uh, for queer characters in the Star Wars universe? I do know it was extremely difficult. There, the inclusion of gay characters in, in uh, Chuck Wendig's book, that was a very recent uh, decision on their part because uh, my Star Wars novel came out in, uh, I think it was 2013, at that point, they they did not want, I mean, uh, any hint that someone was a was a. I have a I have a character in there. I wanted to make bisexual, and I tried to get that across as best I could. But um, there was a, even a bit in there that I, it's actually ended up in the finished book. But they kind of tried to take out everything in there that might have suggested that. And she actually she she is a original character who is helping Leah to escape from something. And she's leaving, and she pats Leah on the cheek, kind of affectionately, and they even took that out. Really? So yeah, so it was. Um, I put it back in, <laughs> but um, because I'm, I'm, I'm a fairly experienced author by that point, and I'm kind of I know how to do things like that. So I would be, I would, I would have been uh, as a, a new author. I would kind of hate to be in that situation because you wouldn't quite know what to do. 
when you've had, I've had probably 20 books out and I just, you just put it back in, <laughs> and, you know, and um, you know what you can, what, you don't let them get away with stuff like that. But, um, yeah, so their decision on, on that was, is very recent and they're sort of making it out like, oh, we've always been inclusive. In fact, the editor who took out my, my cat on the cheek uh, was talking about, oh, well, this is so wonderful and stuff. It's like, well, it wasn't that wonderful. Yeah, two years ago, so. Uh, from the description of the panel, there's actually um, Juhani, who's in KOTOR, a nice of the older public, and she was literally the first lesbian character, but I always thought Mara Jade was at least bi, so. But it, it's one of the unfortunate things is you can project onto the characters, but it was never explicitly stated, which makes it difficult for inclusion because you're like, well, I like this character to be this way, like the Pope and Slash kind of stuff. But it doesn't mean that it is that way, and it doesn't mean that you're represented. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me like there were actually a couple of characters in the video games that were at least bisexual, um, if, if, if not gay or lesbian. Um, do you think that a part of that might be because of the fact that gameplay offers the opportunity for uh, the player to become involved in creating the character and steering the character in, in a way that uh, a book or a movie might not? I, I'm going to chime in on this one because I am completely um, not remembering it, but there is actually a game that came out pretty recently, and someone in the audience, please tell me what this is because it's going to drive me nuts, where you could hit on characters of the same, NPCs of the same gender, and people flipped. They were like, we can't do this, how dare you do this in our game? So, I, I don't think it's that way, but I think it's more that people can get away with more in writing games. Because the intellectual properties are different, and they're, I, I, maybe I'm wrong on this one, but I feel like the games are less rigorously um, lockstep in the traditional, like, we have to write Star Wars this way because this is the way we've always written and has to remain canon. I think there's several games that happen too. It seems like I, it's like no one name names because I might say the wrong game, but yeah, it seems like that's happened several times. I'm thinking maybe Elder Scrolls, but I'm pretty sure it's wrong. It kind of happens. The game company sort of has to put their foot down and say, no, we're, no, this is how we're doing it, and that's if you know if you don't like it, you'll play other games. So I think there's also something about the audience for these works. The the audience who is reading the literature, whether that's novels or um, graphic. Uh, novels or uh, playing games, they're a self-selected bunch of fans, right? And they want to be as, as deep into canon and also help be co-creators with it. Whereas the films are, are also trying to bring in the casual audience. And so there's the sense that the least risk possible <laughs> is, is the way to go there, which I find ironic since, you know, Abrams has promised that we're going to see a character uh, on the screen um, whether that's a new character or a character that we already know uh, have uh, um, his or her preferences revealed. Um, but of course, Star Trek has already uh, made that leap before Star Wars. So it's not going to be the thing that they were hoping it to be. But I think moving into um, ever more narrow uh, niche audiences, um, those people are going to stay with Star Wars no matter what. And so you might as well reward the people who are looking for something different and who, who are um, uh, wanting to, to push the boundaries of Star Wars versus people who just, you know, they're hoping to bring people in for a popcorn movie that aren't necessarily um, hard to And And, and uh, Dr. Sergius definitely makes a good point there. Um, however, you know, the, the, the problem, I, I have a lot of problems with J.J. Abrams. Um, Let's play. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just thinking about all of the times that he swore up and down that Benedict Cumberbatch wasn't con. Oh, man. And, and that was so disappointing. And unfortunately, um, it's also a situation where J.J. Abrams, while he is a, a producer in name uh, of, of the further films in the Star Wars saga, he, he doesn't really have the same call that a director or writer uh, or someone who's directly involved with the production does. And that was actually one of the, uh, one of the things that uh, was brought up when he brought up his comment that there was going to be a gay character in Star Wars. 
Well, Kathleen Kennedy is really the one that's done most of the innovative stuff. He gets credit for it, but um, didn't she cast Finn and uh, John Boyega and, and Oscar Isaac and, and, you know, wanted Ray as the main character and everything? So, yeah, I think a lot of the more innovative stuff is, is down to her. And change the gender dynamic of the writers in the story yes. too. Yes. Yes. Um, and I know that Oscar Isaac has said that he, he wants to, he wants, I think he wants to to be gay. He said he was trying to play it that way to leave that option open. Or that, it's not exactly what he said, but that's kind of the impression I got. So, but a lot of times the actors are so much more open to that than, than, than you know, the, the production company. Ghostbusters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I think, I'm I think sorry, the ambiguity works for audiences. Well, one of the points that was brought up actually uh, by Oscar Isaacs, um, I, I think he, he mentioned on, on the Ellen show um, that he was playing the scene in the time in the Tie Fighter with John Boyega uh, as as more of a, a romantic back and yeah. forth than anything else, and that was and that it was really worked. Well, his yes. exact quotation was, "I think it's a very subtle relationship that's happening. At least I was playing romance." Yes. Yeah. That's in his head, and it comes out on screen, maybe for some people and for others it doesn't. Uh, there's two, there's always, there's always, the audience is the writer. And, and it's also interesting, too, in that, um, you know, we, we've also got this situation where there's this incredible amount of information that's been created up to this point in this, this, um, you know, uh, expanded universe of Star Wars that allowed, you know, so much creativity in so many different areas and so many different points of view that all has been officially just swept away. Yeah, my book got swept away too. Yeah. My book got swept away. But is that necessary? Is that, a, is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? Are there advantages or disadvantages to using that much canon and being able to create new canon in the modern era? I, I think it's a, it's an advantage to the upcoming writers because apparently they've opened with, uh, again with Aftermath, it's, it seems like they've opened up a lot more and maybe a lot more willing to, to do LGBT characters and do different things. It really did seem like my experience with them, not necessarily Lucasfilm, but at least the, the people who thought they were doing Lucasfilm's wishes was that it was very uh, stiltified in a lot of ways. It felt like um, the, the idea that it felt like I had to, it was a lot more restrictive. It's almost like I was supposed to be writing a book for children, even though it was an adult, you know, Star Wars novel was not marketed as a YA or a children's novel. You couldn't swear, characters couldn't swear, uh, little crazy things like that that didn't you know, make a lot of sense. I was like, I was thinking back to the first movie, it's like, I know they said the first trilogy, I'm like, I know they swore. You know, it's like the whole thing with the Tauntaun is that I'll see you in hell. You can't say hell now. Or I couldn't say hell in my book. Damn fool idealistic crusade. Damn fool idealistic crusade, but you couldn't use those in the book now. It was just kind of weird. It was like they had. It was, it was like a game of telephone where the, the, the source material had sort of gone through this evolution and now had become this sort of squeaky clean thing. And I'm not sure that that's people thinking that, people assuming that that's going to be Lucasfilm's wishes or George Lucas's wishes or um, his actual wishes. Because I know at times, it's, years ago I was on a Star Wars panel with someone who's writing a book and he had had Han and say, He's, uh, he, that Spice was, he said Han had Han saying Spice was a drug, and the editor was like, oh no, we can't say Spice is a drug because it would, you know, drugs, kids and drugs. And he was like, no, Spice, and they argued about that, and he finally argued so much that they sent it up to George Lucas, and it came back with a note saying, of course Spice is a drug. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it's, there's such a barrier between you and the top down, I think a lot of people are they're making assumptions that, you know, they don't necessarily have to make, but now sort of become, code, it had become codified in the expanded universe. Well, and your point about the stagnation of the characters, I think, is one of the reasons why they went away from the original canon books. Simply because they were set in stone. And you couldn't, like, even Mara Jade, you couldn't be like, well, we're going to change Mara Jade because she was already written and she was already written in a very specific way. What I like about what they've done is they've kept the canon that they need to use for the current and upcoming movies and novels. But what they've done from there is saying, we can talk more about everyone else in the universe. 
And I think that they're doing that in a way that's not only inclusive, but also representative. And I love that they've done it because they're having characters that basically they could get away with bunches of aliens that look different, but they couldn't get away with humans that look different from white people. Yeah, <laughs> weird. Yeah, it, it's super weird. But and it, it feels like it, they're opening it up to be more inclusive and more, it allows everyone to have a stake in it and allows everyone to enjoy aspects of it because they can see themselves and they can say, hey, this character is like me. I can identify with that character more than I could other characters. I feel like I have a stake in this now and it becomes even more invested. Can, can I bring up something that may seem a little dark, maybe even disrespectful for you, but um, Slash is not respectful. Slash is not respectful. And I'm wondering to what extent this question comes up because um, people are viewing these character relationships in a slash, from a slash perspective rather than from an inclusive perspective. See what I mean? In other words, they're, it's almost prurient rather than inclusive. I think this is just a question. I, uh, I don't know. I think, I think you've got both sides, but I think there are people who are viewing it as slash. I see where you're coming from, and I, I get that. But I think it's also a response to not having any representation. Um, because when you, they want Finn and Poe to be in a relationship together because there's an element there that's like, oh, well, maybe they are, maybe they're like me, maybe, maybe I can have some part of this. And yes, there's people who are like, her, her, her sex, you know, whatever. But there's also the people that are like, I, I want to see more, I want to see more representation, I want to see more people like me or people like the people I care about. Well, it needs to look more like the real world. You know, what's what happened with women uh, when I came up reading stories in which everybody, all the adventurers were male, and of course I put myself into their position because I was, I identified, and yet I don't think the authors even thought of that. They never thought that a little girl was going to read this and decide she wanted to go to Mars. So I think the same thing is what you're talking about, you know. Well, that was kind of an aspect of 70s books when when I was growing up, it was very difficult to find novels, you know, science fiction adventure novels that had a woman who wasn't, you know, the babysitter, basically, or the load, or whatever. So, now, young people are looking at these and, and maybe they are uh, identifying and saying, oh, he, maybe he's gay, and that's good. And maybe it doesn't have to be explicit, or maybe it does. I, I kind of think it does have to be, it, it doesn't have to be explicit in the adult sex sense, but explicit that it's, it's stated. I think that would be better for, for, uh, for, for, for kids who need to see themselves in their, in their heroes and heroines. Well, I think the science fiction world has gotten bigger, and I think our universes within that need to get bigger too. We need to have, the, we need to have, and I hate saying representation over and over again, but it's something that needs to happen. Because, like, and again, like you were talking about, when we have to have an increased demographic, when we have to introduce new readers, new viewers into the canon, into the universe, they're going to want to see gay characters. They're going to want to see people of color. They're going to want to see people that look like them. Because it's not just straight white dudes reading science fiction anymore, although that's kind of a false statement, too. It's everyone is loving science fiction. Everyone is like, oh, it's Star Wars. I grew up with Star Wars. I hate the prequels. But people talk about that. <laughs> I, I, when I was a kid, I had memorized every line in The Empire Strikes Back. Every single line. I don't remember them all now. But it, it was that much concern in my childhood. So to grow up and be like, oh, oh, well, there, I, I don't see anyone like me. I don't, I don't feel like I can be as part of this as everyone else. I was going to say, I just, it, it may be just my perception, but it feels like when I was in, in the early 80s, there was a lot more opportunities, especially in novels, you would see more LGBT characters and you would see more different aspects, I guess because it was, I don't know, it was, it was less of a big business back then and there wasn't maybe as much corporate stuff, but, um, and it felt like during the 90s, everything kind of closed in a little bit and you saw like the genre sort of closing in and becoming more typical. It, used to, it, it was especially obvious to me in fantasy, we used to have a huge variety of different sorts of fantasy and in the, the late 90s, there sort of became this pressure where everything has to be sort of games of, like Game of Thrones. It always has to be that, that, that kind of epic template of fantasy. So 
so I think it's been the same way. I think there's been this sort of weird pressure for everything to become more homogenized. And hopefully now we've finally gone through that phase and it's opening up again and we're getting, there's more opportunities to have all sorts of different characters and all sorts of different stories and different voices. Because and I really like that pattern. And the science fiction world has always been more open to differences. Well, and uh, well, some parts of it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, sorry. One of the other things I like about the new canon um, is the, the sort of dialogue that the different um, media are having within each other. So you've got a character from the Clone Wars now making the leap to the screen. And you've got characters who were original, um, I'm thinking of Ray Sloan here from John Jackson Miller's uh, work. Now we see her in other authors' work, and we see her in, um, in comic version as well as in, in other novels. And that gives me hope for characters like Sinjir, um, who we see in, in Chuck Wendig's work. Um, I, I'll admit, I don't really like Chuck Wendig's writing at all. I, have, I don't mean the content, I mean the actual writing itself. But I got a great excitement over this character. I think it's important not only that Sinjir is there, but that he is the most compelling character in the book and the most three-dimensional uh, in the book of the original characters that are in there. And the fact that I don't like his writing, there are going to be other writers who pick him up because there are a lot of people who love Sinjir. And so I don't always have to just go back to one author. I'm expecting him to show up in other places, maybe um, on, uh, on, on television, maybe in, in graphic novels, but he's going to, to stay around. And that's something that excites me about what the story group is doing too, because um, there is this sense that all of the different texts are speaking to each other, the visual ones and the, the, um, you know, the, the hard text ones and others. And I think that's a great way of storytelling. It's great. Any, any entry point is a gateway drug to all of it, as opposed to the barrier to entry that, that the old canon used to be, in a way, because it had just become so huge and homogenized. Well, one of the things they were trying to do before Disney bought them, I think that they had realized things had gotten really a little bit too set in stone. Uh, because I was brought into it, they were trying to do a trilogy that would be science fiction fantasy authors who had not written Star Wars before who would do a new book. And they would be set between the New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. So you could, uh, even though in the expanded universe that, that's pretty much covered, but I think they were trying to wedge in some new ideas and try to kind of open that up a little bit more. And James S.A. Corey, um, uh, who's... who's uh, I can't remember Ty's last name. It's Daniel Abraham. Ty Frank. Frank. Yeah, and uh, Daniel Abraham <clears throat> are, were, are James S.A. Corey. And um, they wrote the first or they wrote the first book, which was a Han Solo novel. And no wait, no, that was the second book. That was the first book. That was the Princess Leia novel. And they were working on theirs, I think. We had almost it was almost time for it to come out when Disney bought them. And there was there was a third Luke Skywalker book, and that got put into the new canon. But they were supposed to work together as a trilogy and that ended up kind of not happening. But, um, so I do think they were trying to open it up. There had just become where we're literally almost every minute of Han and Luke and Leia's lives from Star Wars on and down the line past that. Because really when we're talking about the Princess Leia novel, I thought about maybe doing a prequel on the family. Like, no, that's all like, there's like 80 books I'd have to read. And it's all set in carved in stone and everything. I have, so, I have a question. If this is about the growth of our civilization because I'm older than everybody on this panel, so I've seen more of the growth of our civilization and the way our lives have been changed. Um, at what point did the DSM stop listing homosexuality as a disorder? That was within my lifetime. Someone had an answer? It was 1974? So, the fact that, you know, the fact that Star Wars has evolved with, with our appreciation of that, and that's before most of you were born. <laughs> but you, you see what I'm saying. I'm saying that, that you know you're you're talking about an audience that is now young people are oh of course you know this is what I want this is and and uh, it, there's still a great deal of uh, people still have a great deal of a great many issues with coming out but at least they can look at a movie like Star Wars or something like that and see role models in it and that's very forward thinking. Well, that's one of the vital things, and that's a, oh my goodness, that's like the best thing ever, is that people that, I grew up in a very, 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 very anti-gay household, 
And to be able to read characters that were like me gave me hope. Because it's like, they're, I'm not alone. And I think just having that and being able to see myself represented was like, okay, I'm not alone. I can deal with this. I can go out into the world and there are places for me. And that's why inclusion is so important. Because it lets especially young people know that there is a place for them out there. And it's not just the hidden places. It's the places that are open and out there. And it's a life and death matter for some people. And I don't think people who aren't in that, who don't feel that and don't know people who feel that and really sometimes don't understand it. And it gets very frustrating where, well, it gets very frustrating to be told, no, you can't have a gay character in your Star Wars novel. And you're like, you know, like half my friends are gay. Because it's, you know, it's like, that's, that's, it's, it's insane. You know, it's, it's, it's a denial of reality. It's also the reason a lot of young people commit suicide. It's a very high rate of suicide. So I think every gay character you put in a novel, a movie, whatever, you're maybe saving a life. I'm sorry, that's just the truth. And, and it, it, at the same time, you know, this, is, this is such an important issue, the issue of inclusivity. But one, one of the things that we're also supposed to talk about is that issue of inclusivity, that issue of, of making that, that those inroads that have not been made previously. But we're also asking this of a multinational corporation that potentially sees business losses in other markets that are not LGBT friendly, like Russia, like China. I mean, al already there are some discussions about, you know, shakeups in, in other universes, like the, the DC universe, where uh, a movie like Suicide Squad has made more money than Batman v Superman in the United States, but it's still going to make less money overall because it can't screen in China because they have ethical issues. How can we reconcile this, this dichotomy? Or, I, I, I realize that's a huge question, but how, is, there, is there some way that we can reconcile this? It's very frustrating that, you know, we can't do anything about it. It's, it's, there, it, it, these decisions are made at such a level in the corporation that, you know, it's out of, out of reach. Corporations exist for the benefit of their shareholders, not for the benefit of the audience. But the thing I feel uh, a little bit optimistic about is there was the whole, you know, people were going, the, the guys who were going to boycott uh, Star Wars because of Finn, and how, you know, and everyone was like, oh, that, they'll be more in the theater for us. And then, you know, Star Wars made enough money to buy, you know, some private island in Maine or something. So, and I'm hoping that showed them that. You know, these groups that are very vocal, it's the whole thing, it's the vocal minority, you know, it's not something they need to cater to. And I think there's also a tendency for people to, I'm not denying that Lucasfilm isn't a massive corporation, by any means, but, um, but we tend to think Disney now, that, that it's Disney era and Disney is doing this. But Disney's proven itself to be a pretty good steward uh, and... Uh, of, of different properties that it, it obtains and, and lets them keep doing what they're doing in a certain sense. And I think we ought to remember that a lot of decisions are being done by, by um, uh, uh, Kennedy and by the, the story group and that Disney isn't micromanaging Star Wars, which I think is why we've got uh, uh, the success that we have right now. Um, and there is a difference in scale, if not in kind, between those two. And I, I think they learned their lesson with Pixar, along those lines. They let them pretty much do whatever they wanted, and they made so much money yeah. off of everything. Like, almost every single movie that Pixar did under their control was an incredibly good movie. But also, I think that there's a false dichotomy in the assumption that just because there are going to be gay characters, people are going to boycott it. There is a lot of money to be made in gay fiction, for example, there are like there are publishers that solely publish gay fiction, and they make a ton of money because it's there and it's people want to read it. People that are straight want to read it. People that are straight want to write it because it's people that they know and they can love and they can talk about. And so it's not that oh no they're going to lose money like for example putting making Finn a black character. 
but is there going to make so much more because there is people who well, care? Remember what happened with the Harry Potter, uh, the, the books, that there's, there's an entire subculture in the United States that believes that Harry Potter, uh, the Harry Potter books are basically about witchcraft and therefore they're evil. And yet, and yet, the movies proceed. So I think, you know, corporations have to have a little courage. They have to, you know, there may be something that's not for everybody, but, and I think, uh, I think the Star Wars, well, well I think there's courage there. I well, think I think it, it's, these, like you said, these fears are so unfounded in so many ways. I mean, <clears throat> my fantasy series, most of the characters are bisexual, and I've never had anybody email me, and I'm very visible, you know, you can find me on social media, and I've never had anybody email me and say they, they were upset by it or anything like that. So I just think the, the, the fears that it are, are sort of coming from, you Hold know, your book up if you don't mind. Yeah, <laughs> I think okay. you did, but hold it up again. Oh, okay. okay. So cool. Oh, and there well, are flyers. And, yeah, there's cards at the end. But, you know, I just feel like the, these fears come from an earlier time period, and, and I think that maybe Disney is big enough now that they don't, they're exercising their power for a certain extent, saying we don't have to be afraid of this, of this vocal minority, we can do what we want. Well, and if I can be Captain Obvious here, <laughs> we've just building on some of these great comments. The storytelling has moved beyond just tokenism, right? We're going to have the character who is black, we're going to have the character who is gay. Um, Finn's a fantastic character, and that's, you know, his race is sort of beside the point. Sinjir is a great character, and he's gay, but he's not the gay character there. Yeah, well, that's, it's like Smurfette, they're not doing that anymore. It's like your whole, the whole thing with Smurfette is that you're the woman, and that's your whole characterization, is that the woman, you know, and they're not doing it anymore. So, yeah. Well, and the important part about representation is more than just the Smurfette factor. It's that you can experience life through other lenses. And I think that that allows for a more interesting read because then we would have the people that are like, well, I want to feel, I want to experience what it's like to be someone else. And someone else maybe not just be, you know, a straight white character. And that's, that's amazing. Well, it's so vital in YA influence books to generate empathy or to, to teach empathy, basically. And, and possibly. Um, oh. These questions? I, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that we can go ahead and take questions. Um, actually, we had one person who had their hand raised first who has been very patient. Um, <laughs> well, I think you all actually, uh, as you, the, the discussion continued and answered the question, um, but I'll try to maybe put a little bit different twist on it. I mean, it's been a great panel. I think you guys all spoke to this, but something that Vivian said did really resonate with me in that you know, we need to explicitly see these relationships. We need to see gay, lesbian, trans, queer people, asexual people, poly people loving each other, you know, in an everyday sort of way. Not in the, you know, quote, woo, woo adult way, but in the everyday way, you know, okay? And is there something, in, but we also spoke to, you know, what influences these corporations, what makes them, you know, put their money there? <laughs> so my question is, do you think that, that to start that Lucasfilms reads fan fiction, <laughs> or it all looks at fan fiction as, as a way to take a temperature on what their fans want to see? I, it, it, does, does fandom in way influence? I don't think this is necessarily the fan fiction does, because there's so much of it. And Lucasfilm has had kind of a fraught relationship with fan fiction, especially when it first started out in the 70s. And, it was kind of a growing thing, and they didn't understand it at all. And now I think most most productions are, I mean, you used to have to put a disclaimer on your fanfic saying you don't own it, and blah, blah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you had to do that because people would occasionally be contacted by lawyers. And it was not always at the behest of the production company. Sometimes they had just like rogue lawyers who would find the stuff online and just flip out and, and work for them. But uh, now that that doesn't, that doesn't happen, and, and production companies realize that this is just a, you know, this is an important marketing tool that they don't have to have any control over or anything. It kind of generates itself. And actually, the more you, if you mess with it, the companies have tried to kind of like control fan fiction and it's never worked out. This is the issue that they are afraid they'll lose control of the character and then the character will become public domain and they can't use it? That used to be a thing, but yeah. it's really legally. I'm not a lawyer, obviously. You know, it just really doesn't have a leg to stand on. Okay. Um, if I, 
If I could rephrase, sorry. Yeah, I think we got off on the wrong track. Is there something, is, is there anything that we can do as fans to help push Lucas to that tipping point? Buy their movies. Yeah, buy the movies and just support yeah. them as a fan. Show the people that are like, we don't want this character because they're gay. We don't want this character because they're a person of color. Show them they're wrong. Yeah, go buy the DVD, buy it on iTunes. I mean, because money speaks. Yeah. 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 It's also a situation, too, where, um, it, and this was brought up earlier, I don't remember exactly who brought it up, but no one wants to be first. Everyone wants to be second. And one of the things that I was hoping that some of the people on the panel might be willing to talk about would be the uh, idea of including Sulu as a gay character in Star Trek Beyond and the potential fallout from the relative financial failure of that film. I didn't realize it had failed. Uh, it, it made it, it made back its original cost, but that means that in Hollywood terms, it's a failure. But it failed less badly than the previous Star Trek film. Is that correct? Yes, it failed much less badly. I think it was the previous Star Trek film that dragged it down because that was a very disappointing film, and I think it, it hurt. And also, their, their commercials were not good, and they made too much of the fact that the director was the Fast and Furious director. And then they showed the motorcycle scene, and everyone went, it's just the Fast and Furious with Star Trek characters. And that wasn't what it was at all. So. And, and can I point out that there's a real difficulty in combining Star Wars and Star Trek? Yeah. Well, yes, but there, there's, there's that, that kind of well <laughs> down. But yeah, I think the, I mean, when they announced, I think Simon Pegg, you know, talked about the scene with Sulu, that they were going to make Sulu gay to uh, kind of, you know, I don't know what he was, for marketing, I think that that scene was sort of, we see him with his husband and their little girl, but she, there was no, there was nothing, there was originally filmed the kiss, which is apparently not in the movie, which is not in the movie. Uh, I think he wanted to make sure people realized, no, really, that's not just his, like, his brother or his niece or something, that's, that's his husband and that's his daughter. I think he wanted to make sure people knew that. And then with the reaction to that, I think it was really overwhelmingly positive. So. And, and I think George Takei originally was like, I don't really feel that's necessary. But I think, and I might be wrong, I'm kind of putting words in his mouth, but I think part of it is because that's not how Sulu was originally written. And it's very hard to tape LGBT character or LGBT characterization on top of an existing character, which I, I think that's why it's very important that we're writing new canon and that they've kind of not erased but replaced canon in Star Wars because you don't have to like paste on, oh, this character was gay all the time, do 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 do. You can say, no, this is a new character and they're gay and they're awesome and I want you to enjoy them. I want yeah. you to be excited about them. I think the fact that everyone knew George Takei was gay for so long that when they said Sulu was gay, a lot of people, especially younger people, were like, isn't he always been gay? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, we had another question in the audience. Yes. Most of you probably don't remember, but yeah. um, 
So I think it's always had it. It's always been able to move faster to take in uh, uh, <clears throat> more different ideas. One of the problems with movies now is the same problem as with Broadway shows. Is it used to be, it used to be able to do a Broadway show with like one or two rich people backing it, and it used to be able to do a movie with you know one one studio backing it. Now those things are so expensive. It takes you know, two or three rich corporations to back a Broadway show, and it's the same thing with movies. Is there's so much money and it's so much expensive that if they has a loss, you know, people fall down like dominoes. Basically, corporations fall down like dominoes if the thing is lost, if the, the, the show is lost. So they have. It makes them so cautious, and that's why you're seeing so many remakes of movies and. and Reboots and things like that because they they don't want to do they're afraid to do original properties because they're afraid to lose their their business they want to go back and do something that's already already been proven basically so it's very hard for those things to go out and do different stuff in a way it isn't for TV yeah, yeah. also um, Clone Wars was a cartoon which obviously the demographic for that is going to be different than people in their you know fifties or sixties who watched Star Wars when it first came out. But it also kind of like preps the audience that's coming up to expect things. And so when they do expect things from the movies, they have very high standards from the Clone Wars and from Rebels. Mm -hmm. They're like, we saw this in this show. You have to keep it up. Otherwise, you're going to completely lose us. Mm -hmm. There's also an opportunity for a real breadth and depth in character development. Uh, and, and in scenes that aren't necessarily built around uh, big effect sequences or, you know, all the uh, expensive action sequences that people have come to expect from, from a theatrical experience, you know, and, and a lot of those small moments might actually help to, to build in or to, or to create opportunities for inclusivity in the relationships. Well, and Star Wars has always been a movie about small moments. Star Wars has always used the power of small, small moments mm -hmm. to show characterization. Like the Han and Leia, I love you, I know scene, mm -hmm. is so powerful and it's such a small moment in between these amazing battle scenes. And it's like, no, that, that was perfect characterization. So I mean, it's, they're experts at that and I'd love to see how they're expanding that toolkit to make it a big thing. I may be over optimistic here, but I think it's also really important that we're having one shot films. Um, I mean, look at the cast of, of Rogue One coming up. Yeah. Um, the international cast, talk about uh, representation, you know, uh, the universes of the United States of America. Um, but they can do that without risking the Skywalker family or without risking, you know, certain, certain ongoing stories. They can try that, which is why I hope everybody goes and sees. Like over and over and over again, like I plan. Trailer looks awesome, doesn't it? Now okay. they can try something without, you know, putting everything on the line. We have another question. More, more on that, really. Um, uh, Rebels and, and Clone Wars, although they're done with animated technology, it's really hard to, to classify them as cartoons as such. They really are ongoing episodic drama. They just happen to use a particular palette to paint it in a very sophisticated science fiction. Yes, absolutely. It was so good. And, 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 that, and that may be part of the, their success in bridging that, that gap. Well, and that's that's the uh, that's the situation now with television is that it allows you, you know, when you, when, when you watch something like The Force Awakens, that's two and a half hours worth of storytelling. You watch something like a 26 episode season of The Clone Wars, and that's 12 hours yeah. to tell a story. So a lot bigger canvas, a lot more character. Okay, we have another question. Yeah. 
for Martha. Um, when you wrote Razor's Edge, was it ever laid out that you, like, verbally you couldn't use any gay characters? Or was it more a subtle pushback on it? It was a subtle pushback. And if you got time for one more question? Yes, sir. Um, just one for general, the whole panel. Do you think Disney would allow Ray to be gay? They certainly, I mean, well, they certainly haven't shown anything about her sexuality one way or the other. I mean, we see her being friends with people, but we don't see anything else, so it's certainly open. You know what I would really kind of like, and maybe this is just me, but I would like to see her as asexual. I think that would be, I think that would be really, really interesting. Because what you get a lot of times with female characters is a love interest. And the, ooh, they're going to have sex with this person. But to have someone be characterized as asexual and have that representation there and have that character development, I think would be absolutely fascinating. That's a really interesting question, too, bringing up the question of whether or not she is going to be Jedi, because there's a whole other bag of stuff that goes along with that. Um, I mean, we've seen flirtations in the, in the uh, television series and such, but in terms of the films, there's sort of no sex, please, we're Jedi, right? And so they're like in a whole other category where they don't get to see anything. Um, so that's a you know, there's a whole lot of stuff going along with that, too, that would be an issue. Okay, I think this brings our panel to an end. If you have any other questions, please come over and uh, come up and uh, ask. Can I make uh, a final comment? Oh, wait. I okay, do. yes, we've been, we have a request for a final comment. Please. Um, there are great works that define civilizations, the Ramayana, the Ramayana, the Odyssey, Ulysses. Uh, the Ramayana, these define the civilizations they were. I think Star Wars defines our civilization because we're a multiple civilization. We have a lot of different currents that we're coming from. We, this, this unites us. So yes, we should make it a diverse, accepted universe. 